My name is Dr Johnson and this is a video about the ultrasound prediction of malignancy in adnexal masses, IOTA risk models including adnex. Imaging of the ovaries. Predicting the risk of malignancy in adnexal masses is very important so that you can diagnose ovarian cancer earlier and enable women with a malignancy to have surgery in a dedicated oncology centre. Also, you can triage women with benign pathology out to benign gynaecology for potentially conservative management or minimally invasive surgery. In this talk, I will talk about the standardisation of terminology using the IOTA definitions, the prediction of malignancy using IOTA simple rules, and the latest IOTA risk of malignancy model called ADNEX. This was the original IOTA paper published by the International Ovarian Tumour Analysis Group. It was published in 2000 and I highly recommend that you read this. I will quickly go over some of the definitions described in that paper. A mass would be described in terms of its locularity, whether or not there's solid material, the cyst contents, whether there's solid material and whether this is a papillation, vascularity, shadows and ascites. In locularity, a cyst can either be unilocular, that is a single locule, or there might be a little bit of solid material present, in which case it's called unilocular solid. It's a very important distinction between unilocular and unilocular solid, as you'll see later. If there is more than one locule, the cyst is described as multilocular. And if there's also some solid material present, it is now called multilocular solid. For a mass to be described as solid, it needs to be at least 80% solid. In other words, there can be up to 20% of cystic content. The cyst contents, the echogenicity is also described whether there are no echoes, some low-level echoes, ground glass, which is just thicker really, some hemorrhagic echoes, or mixed, where there's uh, clearly different shades of grey. A solid component is a structure that has the echogenicity suggestive of tissue, but it has to measure at least three millimetres. The white ball of a dermoid is not solid tissue, and blood clot or mucin is not solid tissue. A papillary projection is a protrusion of three millimetres or more in height from the cyst wall. This also counts as a solid component. If it's less than three millimetres in height, it's an irregularity. And if it's less than three millimetres in any diameter, it is not solid. An irregularity means either an irregular internal cyst wall or the irregular outer contour of a solid lesion. So here is an image showing the difference uh, whether or not a solid area is also a papillation. You can see on this side that there is, a, if this was more than three millimetres in height, which it is, this indents, this cyst wall, it is therefore a papillation. Whereas this bit of solid material here, it's solid, it's more than three millimetres, but it does not indent the internal cyst wall. So it does not count as a papillation. The vascularity score is very important. We get this using colour Doppler with a PRF of not, between 0.3 and 0.6. I usually start at 0.6, but if I want to prove there is no flow, then I go down to 0.3. This gives you a velocity scale of 3 to 6 centimetres per second. And when you've got that, you then need to adjust your Doppler gain to just below the artefact level. When you've done this, if there is no flow at all, you can't find any, even at PRF 0.3, that is a score of 1. If you really have to look for the colour, then that's a score of 2. If when you turn your colour Doppler on, the flow is just there, that's a 3. And if you have strong flow throughout in one area or, or throughout the mass, then that would be a score of 4. Here are some images illustrating that. So in this area, there was no colour at all on a PRF of 0.3, so that's a score of 1. Here you can just see a tiny little bit of flow in the periphery of this cyst. Very important to look for that. That's a score of 2. 
This colour was just there when I turned it on, so that's three. And here you can see some very strong colour in one area, but nonetheless, that's a four. And if ever you're not sure whether something is uh, one or two or three or four, you always go for the worst one. And it's, of course, one and four that are the most important, as you'll see in a moment. We also look for shadowing and you have to actively look for this. This is dense shadowing behind a mass, but you also can find very fine shadowing behind a mass and it's important to actually go and look for this. Ascites is described as fluid outside of the pouch of Douglas. So in a longitudinal view, the patient's head here and her feet here. This is a, an axial, almost slightly antiverted uterus. This is the pouch of Douglas, and you can see if you draw a line at the fundus of the uterus that there is fluid above it. So this is ascites. Now I'd like to talk to you about iota simple rules. Firstly, we need to talk about the descriptors, simple descriptors. This is basically pattern recognition, and at least half of all admixal masses will fit one of these descriptions. These masses are endometrioma, dermoid, simple cyst or cyst adenoma, physiological cysts like a hemorrhagic cyst, or a malignant tumour with ascites. If you see those, you know what it is, you don't need any further risk models to help you predict the risk of malignancy. Then after that, the IOTA group published Simple Rules. This paper came out in 2008 and talked about benign features and malignant features. Here are the benign features. If a cyst is entirely unilocular, that means there is no solid material because that would make it unilocular solid. If it's a unilocular lesion, so it's one, one locule, it might have an incomplete septation but no complete septation. So one locule, no solid material, that's unilocular. If there is a tiny solid component of less than seven millimeters, and this one was four and a half, this again counts as a benign feature. If there is shadowing behind the mass, that's a benign feature. If the mass is smooth and multilocular, less than 10 centimetres, that's a benign feature. So again, you can't have any solid material in here because that would make it multilocular solid. And we're talking about multilocular. And the reason for less than 10 centimetres is that beyond 10 centimetres away from the probe, it becomes very hard to spot tiny little bits of solid material. And then, of course, it would be multilocular solid. So only up to 10 centimetres. And if you have no vascularity in a mass um, with a PRF of 0.3, that's a benign feature. And the simple rule is that the mass is classified as benign if there are one or more benign features in the absence of any malignant features. These are the five malignant features mentioned in simple rules. Top left, you can see an irregular solid tumour. It's irregular because the internal cystic spaces are irregular and also it has an outer irregular contour. So this is an irregular solid mass. At least 80% of it is solid. If there is ascites, and we talked about that just now, if this, this is the pouch of Douglas, if the fluid extends beyond the pouch of Douglas, that's ascites, it's a malignant feature. If there are at least four papillary structures, so these are little solid lesions of at least three millimeters in height from the, from the cyst wall, if there are at least four, that's a malignant feature. If the mass is irregular, and multilocular solid, more than 10 centimeters in size, this is a malignant feature. And here you can see a great many locules. It's irregular because there's also some solid material, papillation indenting the cyst wall. This is irregular multilocular solid and it was way more than 10 centimeters. And strong blood flow is the last one. It doesn't have to be strong throughout the lesion. It can be strong in part of a lesion. Here you can see the mass. There is very strong vascularity in the solid component. And so when you're looking for colour in a mass, don't just look at one area, look all the way through. And of course, if you move your probe too quickly when you have colour on, you get a lot of artefact. 
but I just wanted to show that in some parts the colour is not very strong but if you look carefully you'll find very strong colour just there. So these are all malignant features and the simple rule is that the mass is classified as malignant if there are one or more malignant features in the absence of any benign features. So the mass is classified as malignant if there's one or more malignant features in the absence of a B feature. The mass is classified as benign if there's one or more benign features in the absence of malignant features. But the result is inconclusive if there are both malignant and benign features or no malignant or benign features, then it's inconclusive. In our clinic, we have this sheet up with the simple rules showing benign features and malignant features. So you can just tick them off and immediately see whether you've just got some benign or some malignant or both or neither. How good is this test? When the test is conclusive, saying either benign or malignant, the sensitivity is 92% and the specificity 96%. But these rules are uncertain or inconclusive in a quarter of cases. So if it's inconclusive or uncertain, what second stage test should you use? You could use risk of malignancy index, but we know it's not very accurate. LR2 is another one of IOTA's uh, risk models. It's very good, but slightly complicated. Simple risk rules with a traffic light system for varying levels of risk. This is very good. Subjective opinion by expert, not every clinic has an expert, or ADNEX, and it's ADNEX I'd like to talk to you about next. This paper was published in 2015 and describes six ultrasound-based features, the maximum diameter of a lesion, the proportion of solid tissue, which means the largest bit of solid material you can find, the largest diameter, whether or not there are more than 10 cyst locules, the number of papillary projections, whether it's 0, 1, 2, 3 or more than 3, whether or not there's any shadowing, and whether or not there's ascites. The non-ultrasound-based features they want is the age, whether you're scanning in an oncology centre, and an optional CA125 level. Using this example, this patient was 49 and had some pelvic pain. She'd had an ovarian cystectomy 10 years previously, wasn't sure which side. Her CA125 level was normal. Here's a little video clip of the examination. And here you can see that on colour Doppler there was a little bit of colour, so that's a score of 2. And in a different plane, you must always scan in a, two planes at least, of course, um, you can see that there's two populations. It wasn't clear that this was in fact two populations. So how to use the ADNEX model. You can download this model from the IOTA Group website and you can put it on your desktop or a phone or both. And then you just do what I do here is enter the details. She was 49, it was an oncology center, it was 90 millimeters. 40 millimetres was the largest component, there was one locule, two papillary projections, no shadowing, no ascites, and 11.7 CA125 level. You then hit calculate, agree with the disclaimer, and then this image shows up. And I'll just go to the next slide and show you the bit of this that I use. I use this main diagram. Um, if you look at the data, it says the chance of that particular lesion being benign was 42.5%. The chance of it being malignant is 57.5%. These are not absolute percentages and you need to choose a cutoff for distinguishing between benign and malignant. And the IOTA people have set that at 20%. This is 58%, so this is coming out as malignant. But then, interestingly, they break that down so that you can see the yellow here is this one. They say there's a 28% risk of it being borderline, less likely stage 1 ovarian cancer, less likely still stage 2 to 4, and only 3% of it being metastatic to the ovary. And here underneath you can see what the 
patient specific risk was and the relative risk, but I didn't use that so much. Adnex predicts that this is malignant because 57.5 is greater than 20% and the greatest risk within that was borderline. So Adnex predicts that this is most likely a borderline tumour. On simple rules, were there any features? It was not unilocular because although there's one locule, there was also solid material. So it's unilocular solid. The largest component was 40 millimetres. Um, there was no shadowing. It wasn't smooth and multilocular, it was unilocular solid. And there was a little bit of blood flow, so there's not no blood flow. So no benign features. No malignant features. It's not irregular solid, it was unilocular solid. There was no ascites. There were two papillations, not four. It wasn't multilocular solid, it was unilocular solid, and there wasn't strong blood flow. So on simple rules, there were no benign features, no malignant features, so it was uncertain or in, in inconclusive. When I scanned this lady, I thought she had a mucinous borderline ovarian tumour. She underwent a laparoscopic bilateral salpinga oophorectomy for a likely malignancy, and the entire mass was popped in a bag and then morselated from outside in. The histology showed a FIGO-1 borderline mucinous ovarian tumour completely excised. So how do these different tests perform? If you look at the sensitivity, the probability that a test is positive if there is cancer, and the specificity, the probability that a test is negative if the disease is absent, i.e. benign. So you're looking for as near to 100 in both of these columns. An RMI level of more than 250 is not very sensitive. The simple rules when they are conclusive and either benign or malignant is a high sensitivity and specificity, but of course they are uncertain in a quarter of cases. Looking at subjective assessment by expert, you have a high sensitivity and specificity. And look at this, if you use ADNEX with a more than 10% cutoff, you have a very high sensitivity and good specificity. This paper was published in 2017 and this group compared all the different models and said that the RMI was the least accurate. Adnex was a very good test but their optimum cutoff was 26% and that gave a high sensitivity and specificity and they found that only subjective appearance by expert was superior to Adnex. So, which prediction of malignancy test to use? CA125 and RMI are not so useful. Simple rules are very good, but around a quarter of cases are uncertain. And ADNEX is a very good test, and it's almost as good as having an expert in your clinic. So, describe the mass using IOTA terminology. Use simple descriptors applicable in half of masses to sift out the really easy, obvious ones. Then use simple rules, which are applicable in 75% of masses. But where they are uncertain, apply ADNEX. Here are some further sources of information for you. There's the iotagroup.org. They have a list of all their published papers, courses where you can become accredited in the IOTA terminology and application. You can download their apps, the risk of malignancy calculators, simple rules, LR2 and ADNEX and look when their next conferences are. There's also more information on this website, or you can follow me on Twitter. Thank you.